We are here today with Teresa Gao. She is the co-founder and managing partner of A Crew Capital and one of the most powerful women in Silicon Valley. Teresa, thanks so much for having us. Thanks for being here. So Teresa, you sit here as one of the most powerful women in Silicon Valley, arguably one of the most powerful women in business, but you didn't start out that way. I think your story is really emblematic of the American dream. And you gave a TED Talk about the American dream and without going into the TED Talk. What does the American dream mean to you and your personal story? It's so central to my personal story. It's, um, I really believe, I know it sounds maybe corny these days, but I believe in the fundamental point that with all of our challenges and uh, in both in our, as our country, but at the end of the day, the American dream still lives because it lives in people like my parents and me and my sister and millions of other immigrants who came to this country to have to have a chance at a better life. Um, and, you know, I never thought that I would be here. I was born in Jakarta, Indonesia and came with my parents when I was a young child and ended up growing up in a town of 2,000 people outside of Buffalo, New York. Um, and I never dreamed that I would even be in Silicon Valley. I honestly probably didn't know what it was. But that just goes to show you, right, that like, look, a lot, you also need to have some luck. But someone once told me that you can improve your chances at luck by working hard, getting a good education, and then really going for something that you're passionate about. And I'm truly passionate about startups, and I've been fortunate to make a really amazing career um, by combining those things together. What did you want to be? What did, mm. what did you imagine would be your career? So when I was younger, so I've always liked math and science, so maybe it's not a surprise that I became an engineer, although nowadays I really just spend time backing other engineers, but that's fun too. Um, but when I was younger, I was really, really interested in being an astronaut. Um, Sally Ride was kind of like, you know, it. Be even before Sally Ride existed, I was all into reading like the right stuff and fighter pilots. But I realized that while I could, um, maybe I was good at math and science, maybe I could help be part of the engineering teams to design those planes or those aircraft. I have terrible eyesight and also probably would never make it through, um, you know, aviation school. And so there you go. Let's, let's design, let's design, let's design aircraft instead of becoming an astronaut. So you went to school for engineering? I did. I did. Um, so I ended up uh, getting a degree in material science and engineering, which it did a lot of work on uh, ceramic composites, which are actually critical to uh, spacecraft and aircraft, but particularly because they are highly resistant to heat and temperature changes, so it's critical for re-entry from the atmosphere. So a little small part of it, but it did, did, there was a through line from the little girl who read the right stuff. Oh, I love that. How did you go from that to Silicon Valley, from NASA to Silicon Valley, if you will? <laughs> well, I was never even NASA. From being an engineer at like General Motors and British Petroleum working on these, you know, new generation materials, so as part of that work, my whole family, um, they're all in medicine, uh, which was what they wanted me to do. And I had different ideas, so engineering was the next acceptable career to them. So, but all I knew about business was like really big companies. Like I said, I did an internship at General Motors. I did an internship at British Petroleum. But when I was, so I didn't even know what startups or Silicon Valley was, but I saw that the people who were engineers that had the jobs that I thought were more interesting weren't necessarily the ones doing like sitting in the lab or behind the computers doing CAD CAM drawings like what I did as an intern, they were actually the product manager. So they would take that research and then actually design it into a product. And all of those people also, they had engineering degrees, but then they also had business degrees because they needed to understand both the consumer demand side of it as well as like, well, we have to build products that are safe and manufacturable. So based on that, I decided that I would try to get an MBA because at that time they all had them and um, studied for my GMATs and then out of, I was fortunate to get into a bunch of schools but um, Stanford was my first choice because it was in the middle of Silicon Valley. Again, I still didn't know about startups but so I wrote about I'm going to become a product manager at like Hewlett Packard or some, you know, one of the big companies that existed back in the 90s when I went to business school and then really being here really literally at the cusp of the internet, right, the early 90s. Um, I remember downloading Mosaic, which is what Netscape became, in the computer lab when I was in, at business school at Stanford, and that just kind of opened my eyes to like, oh, well, you can be a product manager but at a big company, or 
they're actually these startups that you know are raising money from venture capital. So that's really I kind of fell into it that way. So then I joined a startup with some uh, classmates from Stanford. We raised some venture capital. That's how I learned about the venture side of things. And then eventually, as they say, I, I joined the dark side and became a venture capitalist uh, and have been doing that ever since. I, side note, I think that phrase is so funny because it's such an intertwined ecosystem. Entrepreneurs need funding. Yeah. Investors need something to fund. So I think they're saying it's intertwined, right? Because it's like the force, right? There's the light <laughs> and the dark. And, the entre and uh, in fairness, the entrepreneurs are the light. They are the ones who are optimists who have to see the future and then really try to build it, right? And we, I don't think we're the dark side, but we, the other side, the yin to their yang. You You're right. I agree. It's an ecosystem. Do you remember your first investment? What was the first company you said that? I want to invest uh, in that. So the first company that I invested in, so this was 1999. Um, and actually it's, um, it's interesting because there are several big companies right now that are doing this. It was, uh, it was in an entrepreneur that I had worked with before, and he had an idea to build sort of internet software that would allow people to make real-time credit decisions in order to extend credit, whether that be e-commerce companies or you know businesses to other small businesses. Um, you can think of it in some ways, essentially, and they started out a little bit around the same time, so, and this company still exists, it's a company called Bill.com. It's, it's not that different from what Bill.com does today. Um, but in the whole full circle, so that was, you know, that 1999, that company ended up getting acquired by somebody else. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, a, you know, a huge success. Um, but interestingly, in full circle, um, Bill.com bought one of our port, one of our A-Crew portfolio companies last year. Um, so it's just kind of really interesting how <laughs> the, the, the lines connect somehow. That's incredible. All right, let's talk. I love full circle moments, and I wanted to talk to you about Acrew. You founded Acrew in 2019. You were 51 years old, and you very quickly, or maybe it was, it seemed quick to the press. It probably didn't feel quick to you. I think your first fund was 250 million dollar debut fund. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how and why you started this. Yeah. So you know, I guess the biggest thing I would say is looking back. Co-founding A Crew with my partners um, was the best career decision I've ever made, hands down. And I know that you know maybe particularly in these times, but kind of always, right? Like the idea of going out on your own and leaving your firm, whether that's a venture capital firm or a big company, and starting something on your own can seem really scary. But now, with the benefit of hindsight, I feel like it's actually the smartest thing you can do is to bet on yourself. Because as managers, right, we, we choose people, you know, to hire, to promote, um, and or also as investors, like, you know, whether it's projects or companies to fund. And we do it in large part, especially at the early stage, on the people. Like, you know, do I believe you are going to be the right leader for this business? And calculated risk is what investment's about, risk reward. Who do you know better than yourself? And so betting on yourself sounds scary, but it's actually probably the most informed bet you'll ever make on a management team. Who can you know better than yourself? You make it sound so easy. My, <laughs> my mind is blown. You, that it requires a great deal of self-assuredness. So I will say I am very fortunate in a couple of ways, right? So I didn't always have this self-confidence, but sometimes, sometimes things happen in your career that seem like they're a big disappointment and you you find yourself being braver to, and having more self-confidence to try something new because the path you thought you had in front of you isn't exactly what you thought it would be. Um, so I'll be honest, that was part of it. I'm not sure I would have done it, except that there were some disappointments um, that led me to sort of rethink what I wanted to do. Um, I know that I was very lucky that I was able to do this, both from the standpoint of being at a stage in my career where I had the resources to like take a chance on myself and that I have amazing support um, from my family and my partners um, to, to do all of these things. So I, I, I want people to think it's easy, but I also want people to understand like, I understand like I'm very, I, have, I understand the pragmatic part of it too and a lot of things have to be in place. So with that said, 
I think that, you know, it's been, it's turned out to be the greatest thing. Um, you mentioned the debut fund. We've been fortunate. A Crew Capital now has, we have over a billion dollars under management. We um, launched A Crew Diversify Capital Fund, which is the largest venture fund focused on increasing diversity of stock ownership in tech startups and bringing those people um, into the wealth generation and onto the boards of these companies. So I'm really excited to be able to bring together my professional passion with my personal passion um, for better diversity and inclusion in tech. Um, so I'm super excited and I feel fortunate. I also think the other big thing is as working moms, we uh, convince ourselves that we need to take the safer path professionally in order to be more stable for our families. And notwithstanding everybody's personal circumstances are different, understanding I was fortunate from that perspective, I have actually found that I'm able to be much more involved and engaged in my children's lives while also being as excited and probably, you know, knock wood as, you know, my career has actually taken off. So both things have really taken off. My, my, my relationship with my kids, my ability, to, you know, because part of it is when you're the boss, whether it's a venture firm or your own, you know, your own business of whatever sort, I'm pretty sure my partners would say, I work just as hard, if not harder than I did before. But the difference is I control the timing and the agenda. So, and I think, I think everybody on the A crew team really appreciates this. So we have a thing, right, which is like, I learned pretty early in my career that if we give people the flexibility to like, you know, hey, we understand it's important to show up at your kid's soccer game, or, you know, if your kid gets sick, then of course you drop everything and go to the doctor, um, or your parent, or whatever. When you give people that flexibility, I found that people actually work harder and feel much more aligned and committed to the place where they work. You hit on a lot of really important points in what you just said. I want to start with the learning moments. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask the question this way. Was there a moment before starting a crew that you were looking at your career and you thought, I can't do this. I need to give up. It's too hard. Juggling family, juggling personal goals, juggling this important work. And if so, what was that moment? There was. So um, I talked about this some. Um, so there was a point where I was having um, some challenges both at work and it also coincided with my divorce from my kid's dad. So as you can imagine, that's a lot of change going on at the same time. And um, I thought about, you know, I had been really fortunate that I was in a position where if uh, if I didn't work again, I, my family would be fine and I could be there, you know, 100% for my kids. Should I just give up venture capital? But I realized a couple of things. One was that the setbacks in the career weren't really related to investing or working with the companies. It had more to do with the culture of the partnership dynamic. And I was like, well, you know what? I have a pretty clear idea of like what I would like that culture to be. Um, and I still love working with my companies and I still love meeting new companies and potentially investing in them. And I think actually the biggest thing was that I realized during that time that I could be there for my kids. My kids were very young then. So I could do like nursery school, drop off and pick up or, you know, um, volunteer to be a um, field trip chaperone for my older kid. And I could do all of those things and still do what I loved. And I actually think, probably not the little one, but the older one was kind of like, you know what, mom, you're like, it's better. Like, you know, cause they, they were getting, to, they, the big kids are far apart in age, as you know. So the one that was older was like nine. It was kind of like, it's really great that you're starting to come to like the, the field trips and stuff, but like, yeah, you don't need to be here all the time. So I was like, okay, this is a good balance. It's like, you know, so just make yourself available in the moments when they want you. And now that they're teenagers, now I really understand it's like being around, but not being around. So when they want you, so it's a long answer, but the short answer is so, you know, I had this like, I had this epiphany where it was like, look, obviously going through a really hard time with, for, for our family. I'm happy to say we're all like a big, beautiful, modern family, <laughs> blended family now. But um, part of it was like the insight from one of my kids. And part of it was just like in talking with 
many of the entrepreneurs that I was fortunate enough to work with, they were like, look, we haven't seen any change. Because I was like, you know, look, I'm going to have to be a little bit like, you know, context switching, not, not always as available for these next few months while we figure out the new schedule and everything else. And, you know, to hear one of them say like, look, we've known you for a long time and you A, seem happier than ever, despite I don't even know what's going on, be because you're like, you're, and you're just still there for us, right? And to have your kids say the same things. So then I was like, okay, maybe I can do this. There's no, like, I'm still young. There's no need to like give it all up. And maybe I think in the long run, it was probably better for my kids because I'm, I, I, I don't think I am, but I could see how if I was, if it was j like to take, to put the career in a box and then just focus on the kids, I could see how I could have become a helicopter mom. I know that about myself. Just treat your kids <laughs> like a portfolio company and they'd be like, no oh, thank you. Exactly. Well, it's actually why the portfolio companies don't want you to just have one, right? <laughs> like it's good to have like five or six because it's like if you're just focused on them all the time, it's like a little too much. <laughs> So it sounds to me, and I've talked to a lot of powerful women about what were the conditions that allowed them to rise to their position. It sounds like you're describing a support system, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. How no, would you totally. describe the conditions that allowed you to sit in the seat that you sit today? Yeah, absolutely. So look, it definitely started kind of going back to the question about my family and emigrating here and the importance. It definitely starts with my family and the support of my family early on and, and sort of telling me that, look, you if you, you know, school is really important, work really hard, be very serious about that. Um, but also even later in life, like my, my parents, I'm, my parents live half a mile away from here. And especially when my kids were young and even now, even yesterday, um, <laughs> when I had to be in two places at once, you know, they help with everything from like helping the kids pick. And, and it's not, it's important because Frankly, now that I have one that's older, I see how strong the relationship is that they have with their grandparents. And so it's a wonderful thing. Not only does it alleviate mommy guilt if you can't be two places at once, but it's really wonderful to see the relationship, multi-generational relationship amongst the family. So it definitely starts with that. You know, I do think, I don't know whether it's education, but like a love of learning, right? Like the thing I love and why I went to the dark side, right? Is, I get to work with five or six companies at a time, all building different technologies, different stages of their growth, different business models, and I get to meet dozens of new companies every month. And so if you really like learning about new things around business and technology, so I think it's like having built, creating the right support system around yourself. Um, and then, frankly, I used to give younger uh, executives like, Find something that you're really passionate about because, look, if you're, I used to give this talk to a lot of like young in their career people, right? It's like, look, you've already, you know, you've got done school, maybe grad school. You're clearly like, you've got the raw materials to be great. Find something that you really love because if you really love it, then the chances that you'll be not just good, but great increases. And at the same time, and maybe this goes to like, take a chance on yourself. If at any point in time you're not loving, and I don't mean every day, obviously no one loves their job every minute of every day, but if for a long period of time you don't love what you're doing, don't be afraid to change and do something else because it just increases the chances that you'll be great at it because it doesn't feel, I mean it's obviously work but it doesn't feel as much like work if you're getting enjoyment from it. Now we are sitting here today for the 50 over 50 franchise which celebrates and highlights women who are stepping into their power over the age of 50 and beyond. Did you ever imagine your career when you were, say, a teen? Did you ever think, when I'm 60 years old, I'm going to be doing this? What did you picture? Um, so I definitely didn't picture this. Like I said, I didn't even, when I was a teen, I didn't even know really anything about Silicon Valley. And I didn't, I probably didn't even know how to spell venture capital, right? So not this for sure. Honestly, when I was a teen, I would have thought being in my 50s, I was like very old. I would not have thought that I would be doing anything much um so i don't know maybe i maybe i thought that i'd be like you know an engineer somewhere and but getting close to retirement and honestly like now i feel like um i feel like there's still so much ahead do you feel like being over 50 is an advantage or disadvantage in your line of work so i think the answer is uh contextual so sometimes it's an advantage and sometimes it's a disadvantage a lot of times, so you know, we we back 
exciting new entrepreneurs and in many place in many types of companies as I'm sure you've read about many people are starting their companies very young so when I started in venture and I was more their age peers now it's very different so I think it can be a disadvantage from the standpoint of the next great 20 something entrepreneur is not necessarily going to be found by me um, but that's why it helps to have a partnership that truly like we, we're fortunate we have three generations so that partner is probably going to be found by my 20 something year old partner on the where it can be an advantage though is what you talked about before in terms of the fundraising right so like our investors who are you know university endowments family offices they tend to appreciate people who have a long track record who they can see you know investing and returning money to their investors in both good cycles and bad cycles. So now I have the fortune or good for good or bad fortune of you know having started my career in the crazy 99 2000 and then down through 2003 and then also um, obviously 2008 2009 and now the current environment. So it depends on the context. I think with certain people who you work with in venture it's an advantage and with others it's not. And then even in working with the companies, you know, being on the board like it's just um, it is an advantage to have seen, you know, have been through 10 M&A transactions and, you know, literally hundreds of follow-on financing. And so in that case, you know, now I've kind of like grown into, I can be the, the elder statesman, if you will, on the board, who can, you know, that, that, that the entrepreneurs will turn to like, okay, especially now, how do we think about what to do when the macro environment is changing, not in a good way for us so rapidly? How do we think about this and find the right balance of, you know, uh, conservative cash, but still going after the opportunities for new technologies and growth that we see. So I would say on balance, I choose to think of it more as an advantage and in the places where it's a disadvantage, I think that's why you have partners and colleagues and you find, you know, you fill in for each other's strengths and weaknesses. That's a healthy perspective. We had someone last year for this package tell us that she was told venture is a young person's game. Mm -hmm. Why are you trying to start your own firm? But it sounds like you've had a different experience and one that allows you to layer your experience on top of your teams. Yeah, I, and look, I had those same questions asked of me when I started my, when I, when I went out and started my first fund at the ripe old age of still in my 40s. Um, so um, I am, I'm aware of that. And so I, again, I think it's, I, I think it is very much around, it's building a partnership and you build the right partnership, just like some of my partners are really, really amazing at investing in fintech companies. And I do a lot of cybersecurity. Like, just like in that same way, there's other things. You know, so it's about building, it's like building a team. I'm a big, I'm a big sports fan, so the analogy, and I'm a big, uh, I'm a big Warriors fan, so I'll, the analogy is like, you know, you don't want five players who are all seven feet tall and play center. You still need a point guard to bring the ball up. You know, you, you <laughs> literally need like people who complement each other. You just alluded to sometimes being the elder statesman in the room. To put on that hat, as you look at women in their, who are just starting their career in their 20s or maybe in their 30s and are experiencing burnout, we have seen mm -hmm. record rates of burnout through the pandemic and pressures on women. Uncertain economic environment doesn't help the situation. What's your advice for women? Let's start broad, just any, in any sector, in any career right now who might be thinking, oh, can't do it, I need to take a sabbatical, or I need to make a change, or this is just feeling too hard. What do you say to them? First of all, I would say, I think that this has been a very hard environment for a lot of people, and I hope that the, through things like good reporting like you, yours and elsewhere, people are at least more aware of the unique, and I'll call them extra challenges, that uh, working moms have. Uh, not that the environment hasn't been challenging for everybody, my advice would be if you feel like your current situation isn't sustainable for yourself, you know, find a place that does sustain you and can still work with your life, your family, as well as your work. Now that might be starting something yourself, which could be like, you know, going freelance instead of working for, so you can have more control of your hours. Um, or frankly, these days, just finding a company Many, many of the companies now allow people to work flexible hours, hours from home. So now that's assuming you love what you do. 
If you don't love what you do, then maybe think about what do you love doing and maybe that is like a complete career change because we've been reading about people who do that too. And you brought up sabbatical. Like, I'm a believer in sabbaticals. I took a sabbatical when I made my decision to leave my big firm and start my own thing. Um, so I'm all for sabbaticals. I think that if you're fortunate enough to have one from your company, you should take advantage of it. And if, if you don't, then you can make your own <laughs> by just changing things. So it's really hard to think about what you wanna do when you're in it like 24 seven. So whether that's like a couple week vacation or an actual sabbatical, depending on what your personal circumstances are, I highly recommend it gives you a lot more clarity on like what's really important and what do you really like. But I would just say, I'm kind of trying to be an optimist, right? Like, so if I take like lemonade out of lemons, I think that so many companies are aware of this and look, they've had to make some adaptations. I think there are a lot more options that are a lot more flexible. I think very few jobs require like 40 hours a week during set hours in a specific location away from your family and your other responsibilities. If you're in one of those, then I think there are plenty of other interesting both companies and in careers that are a lot more open. And what's your advice specifically for entrepreneurs in this uncertain mm. economic environment? I know there's a yeah. lot of a lot of nerves out there for lack of a better word. Yeah, so the advice that I give the entrepreneurs that I'm fortunate enough to work with is the following, which is so we we don't control the macroeconomic environment. We never have. So have a lens and understanding of what's happening in the macro, which for entrepreneurs right now, it's really hard to raise money. So I don't know when that's gonna get better, but I don't think it's gonna be any time real soon. So then you should think about, well, the money that you have today, what's the best way that you can invest it? Whether that's, if you're far enough along, becoming profitable so that you have control of your own destiny, as I say, you'll decide if and when you ever raise more money, or if that's not possible, finding that right balance of you know, conserving your cash to have it last as long as possible so you can grow. You know, the point is still to grow or meet your milestones, but it's, it's a different view, right? Whereas like last year was sort of like growth at all costs, right? Now, different environment. Okay, what, have you, what resources do you have today? And what's the most you can get to with what you've got today? It will get better. Even in 2000, because I lived through it, it does get better. It might be a couple of years, but it'll get better. How does right now feel compared to 2008 or 2000? So to me, it feels, for tech anyway, for entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, I'm afraid I think it feels a little bit more like 2000 than 2008. So 2008 was obviously a really significant macroeconomic shock, the Great Recession. Um, but for tech, a lot of it was focused around um, financial services, banking, and real estate. So the return to normalcy for capital raising and just growth for tech companies in Silicon Valley came back pretty quickly in a couple of quarters. Whereas in 2000, we were the epicenter, and some might say we are again. Um, and so huge run up in 99, huge crash in early 2000, and it was probably a good two or three years before the capital started flowing back to tech startups. Uh, now, realizing the run-up wasn't quite as severe, as fast as it was in 99 versus now. So I think we're gonna be somewhere in the middle, um, meaning I think it's gonna be hard to raise money. Like we've seen there's very few IPOs, for example. Um, for this year, and I personally think most of next year, so maybe it'll be about a year and a half or two years instead of three years. Um, but we, on the other hand, the reason for optimism, especially for companies that are in tech that are earlier stage, is that the size and scale of the market opportunity is so much larger. I think when, um, when Netscape went public in 1996, there, the total number of internet, like people who, who had access to internet through browsers or computers back then, internet through dial-up or whatever else, was measured in the sort of 60 to 70 million uh, in the whole world. And in 2020, I think the number, because many people have multiple devices, I'm sure you do, I know I do, was something like 5 billion. Wow. 
So if you just think about the scale, and that's not even talking about the fundamental technology scale, right? So cloud computing, machine learning and artificial, like the technology advances. So I'm medium to long term super optimistic because the, the like technology now, every company I think is a technology company. You read about it even like car companies now are technology companies, mm -hmm. which on the bad side we found out that was true, right, with the supply chain mm -hmm. <laughs> crisis and like when they didn't have semiconductors. So technology is just much more integrated into so many parts of the U.S. and global economy. So that's why I'm medium to long term super excited about, you know, being fortunate to be a tech investor here in Silicon Valley. In the short term, I think that it's going to be, it's going to continue to be hard to raise money, right? The Fed keeps raising interest rates, just cap, you know, capital is getting tighter by design. Um, and I don't know, you know, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, I don't know when that's going to get better. But I think the comp people who are building real businesses, you know, the last couple of downturns, you talked about 2008, 2009, some great companies have come out of those downturns. And I think that um, this, this current downturn will be the same. So medium to long term optimistic for tech investors. What about for women? We've seen, mm. I've covered the funding statistics year over year over year, and you see a little bit of progress, a little bit of pullback. It feels a little bit like two steps forward, one step back. What's your outlook for women right now? I'm medium term excited. I guess I've been, I've been following those statistics long enough to see that it's made some meaningful improvements. You're right, not in the last couple of years, but I go back to like 2000. So when, at least in terms of the percentage of, of female founders, uh, as a percentage of companies receiving some venture capital backing, that number has like doubled. The dollars have been stubbornly small and it's still only about 2%. Um, but the reason why I'm bullish, uh, even in the shorter term, right? Two things, one is, when I talk to younger female entrepreneurs, it's a very different mindset than, you know, even 10 years ago. Meaning they understand the challenges, but they are much more undaunted and also see it as a potential area of strength. Great networks like all raise and there, there, there are there are networks to support one another and move things forward. That's one. Um, and Two, I'm excited because as more women become successful executives and entrepreneurs, they start investing either as an angel investor or as an investor in venture funds like mine and others, right? And so the virtuous cycle starts to build. Like it's long been held, like people say it's a boy, so it's true, right? Like there's a reason why uh, people have written a lot about the PayPal mafia. And weed is amazing, a lot of like, but there's also a reason why, like how have they been so successful? Well, PayPal was really successful. A bunch of them leave to go start other things. They ask their friends to invest in their companies. And there's, there's nothing nefarious about it. It just becomes a self-reinforcing mm -hmm. network. Why well, I'm excited because I think we finally have some really amazing self-reinforcing networks of women entrepreneurs and investors. So the flywheel is beginning. I know you've talked about being often the only woman in the room, particularly earlier in your career. And I know that's often framed as a negative thing, a very lonely thing, and it can feel very lonely. But I am wondering, were there ever moments that you felt like it was a competitive edge? Well, you know, I tried to, early in my career, because that was the reality all throughout my 20s and 30s, I realized that it can be positive and it can be an edge. So I realized that, for example, in, uh, at conferences or trade shows, or even during a fundraising process, I, once I realized that I might be the only woman that that entrepreneur or that entrepreneurial team might meet the entire day at a conference with 30,000 people um, and that they might be fundraising and going to dozens of venture capital firms and I would, might be the only woman that they would meet in that process. The way I thought of it in my own mind anyway as a potential advantage was, well, if I can make a good connection with them by asking them a smart question or making a smart comment about their, if it was at a conference, like about their, about their trade, their demonstration or in a, in a pitch meeting about their business, that when I wanted to follow up with them and I sent them an email, um, since I have a female uh, presenting name, the chances that they would remember who I was out of the 
50 or 100 people that they had met was actually higher. So I was like, because when you, especially early in your career, when you're like, you know, there's, there's dozens of young associates trying to find like the hot company and like make that impression, I was like, okay, if I can make a moderately positive to positive impression, I'm more likely to be remembered than someone who makes a similarly positive impression because we're all wearing the same uniforms and everybody had the same first name. Like I worked at a firm with like more guys named Jim, Joe, and John than females. Um, true fact. Uh, that, that was my advantage. That's what I told myself was going to be my advantage instead of being focused on the fact that I was going to be the only woman in the room or the only woman they might meet in their entire fundraising process. I like that. Early in my career, I was a personal finance and markets reporter, so found myself in various rooms on Wall Street and was very self-conscious of I'm the only person in the room who's wearing red or the only woman in the room and then I'm also wearing red on top of it. So I felt like I really stood out and I think it made me shrink back in moments. But it sounds like you really leaned into it. I leaned into it from that perspective, but it's funny you talked about the way you dress because in the 90s, 2000s, you know, the VC uniform back then used to be light blue button down and some sort of khaki pants. Now it's like jeans and a hoodie because we want to look like the entrepreneurs. But anyway, so I never wore dresses. I literally like copied the uniform because I didn't want to, I was like, I'm obviously going to stand out as the only woman in the room. So I'm at least going to like try to look like, look the part. I should look like a VC, so I should dress like the other VCs. That's so interesting. Well, now other VCs can dress like you. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time until I felt like I could dress like myself. I had my work wardrobe and my real wardrobe. I think that's been an evolution for a lot of women, yeah. I have to say. I think so, too. What do you wish someone had told you about aging or being over 50 that you know now that you didn't know when you were younger? One is that I wish someone would have told me that, um, so on the positive and the negative, so on, on, the, on, the, on the positive, I wish someone would have told me that just being more comfortable in who you are um, would give you a kind of confidence and self-understanding that would actually help you in your career as well. Um, and on the not so positive, um, I wish someone would have told me that um, as you get older, the gray hair needs to be dyed more frequently. <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> because I think it's still true that, right, like, when, if men go salt and pepper, they're perceived as being, you know, you know, more serious, more, more gravitas. Um, and I do think in this, you know, to your prior question about like, is it an advantage or disadvantage in venture and in tech to be older? I think in that case, it can be a disadvantage to be perceived as older, particularly if you're a female. Mm. Well, Teresa, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, it was so fun.